Do you think that it will be necessary to use military force to bring down Colonel Ajuka's regime? Yes, it is necessary. I think I have made this point before that if the integrity, corporate uh, existence of this country is threatened, I will use force to maintain it. If civil war comes, and I do think it is imminent, you're quite right. It will for us be the price of freedom. Our people here have for a long time been prepared for this eventuality and I am confident of their readiness. I think that when it does come, that the people on the other side would be surprised as to what they're going to get. And I'm confident that it will not last long. Okay, everybody on your feet up! Let's go! The motor! Come on! Come on, baby! Following Nigeria's second military coup in July 1966, which claimed the lives of the first military president and over 200 officers from the eastern region, the country's future seemed bleak after six years of independence. Compounding the situation, riots were scattered in the north, resulting in the deaths of over 30,000 Easterners, the Igbos. Survivors returned to the east with harrowing tales, and between mid-September and December 31, 1966, an estimated 1 to 2 million refugees from the north, and half that from other regions, sought refuge in the eastern region. Despite promises from the new military ruler, Lutkol Yakubu Gowon, to halt the killings, violence persisted. Gowon initiated plans for military governors to address the crisis, but Lutkol Ojukwu, the eastern region's military governor, refused to recognize Gowon's leadership and attend meetings within Nigeria for safety reasons. On January 4 5, 1967, General Ankara of Ghana hosted a crucial meeting at Aburi. The key agreement was that each region would manage its affairs, with the federal military government handling matters affecting the entire country. Despite shaking hands and promising adherence to the agreement, Gowon, on January 26, 1967, rejected the main points agreed upon at Aburi. In response, Ojukwu decreed that federal revenues collected in the east, excluding oil, would be used internally to address the region's displaced people. The mention of oil revenues alarmed the Supreme Military Council, as most of Nigeria's oil was in the minority non-Igbo East. Gowon swiftly issued Decree No. 8, granting him absolute power over any regional government. Ojukwu rejected the decree and began planning the secession of the eastern region. To prevent secession, Gowon divided Nigeria into 12 states, cleverly splitting the eastern region into three states, isolating the core Igbo territory from the oil-rich minority regions. In early May, Gowon imposed a blockade on the eastern region, prompting Lokkol Chukwemaka Odumegu Ojukwu to declare the independence of the eastern region on May 30, 1967, renaming it the Independent Republic of Biafra. In the subsequent month, a tense calm settled over Biafra, as its population anxiously awaited the unfolding events. On July 6, 1967, Nigerian artillery shells started bombarding the town of Ogoja, situated 10 miles from the northern border. The Nigerian military high command initiated a full-scale assault on the seceded region of Biafra, initially described as a police action. Colonel Mohamed Shua, former commanding officer of the 5th Battalion in Kano, led the 1st Division of the Federal Army in a series of attacks on Biafran northern border towns, including Abudu, Ogoja, Gakem, and Suka, as part of Operation Unicord. The primary objective was to swiftly capture Inugu, the Biafran capital, with the anticipation of achieving this goal within a matter of weeks, if not days, to bring an end to the operation. The 1st Division was organized into two brigades, each consisting of three battalions. Majid Sule Apollo, the leader of the initial assault on Biafra, 
commanded the 1st Brigade, assigned with the capture of the strategic towns of Agugu and Suka. Nsuka, being a crucial commercial center in Biafra, held particular importance. Following this, detached elements were designated to move southward and assess the perimeter defense of Nugu, located approximately 35 miles farther south. The 2nd Brigade, under the command of Marge Martin Adamu, received the task of advancing on Anugu from the east, capturing the towns of Ogoja, Obudu, and Gakin in the process. The offensive relied on effective communication and coordination, banking on the expectation of minimal resistance from the Biafran army. Initially, the Biafran response was weak with poorly assembled and commanded elements. Ojukwu took the initiative to release officers involved in the first military coup from prisons in the eastern region, including Majors Kaduna Nyogwu, Emmanuel Ifejuna, Timothy Onwatuegwu, Humphrey Chukwuka, and Leet Cole, Victor Banjo, who was imprisoned by Agui Ironsi due to an assassination attempt. In the initial days of the conflict, the under-equipped and largely volunteer Biafran army faced vulnerability to heavy artillery bombardments from Nigerian forces. The defending Biafran troops from the 7th Battalion, overwhelmed by artillery and mortar fire, were forced to withdraw. On July 29, 1967, Major Chukwuma Kaduna Nziogwu, the leader of Nigeria's first military coup, now a Biafran loop colonel, was killed in an ambush near Nsuka during a night reconnaissance operation against the federal troops. Despite being an enemy soldier killed in combat, Gowon ordered Nziogwu's body to be flown to Kaduna and buried with full military honors. By the end of July, the federal army had successfully occupied Ogoja, Obudu, Gakem, and Nsuka, bringing the Biafran capital of Anugu within sight. On July 25, 1967, the Nigerian 3rd Marine Commando Division, led by Kola, Benjamin Adekunle, launched a surprise seaborne assault on the island of Boni, east of the Niger Delta, a crucial oil-loading terminal for the Shell BP pipeline from Port Harcourt. The objective was to conquer the waterways and disrupt logistics for the Biafrans. On August 8, 1967, Biafran troops from the newly formed 101st Division, commanded by Col of Victor Banjo and assisted by Lutz of Col Emmanuel Ife Juna, executed Operation Torch by crossing the Niger at Onitsha and landing in the Midwestern city of Asaba. They quickly took control of key facilities and communication lines. The 12th Battalion moved west towards Benin City, capturing it while the 18th Battalion moved south towards oil-rich areas like Wari, Sapeli, and Ugeli. The 13th Battalion headed north towards Alchi and Ajenabodi. On October 5, 1967, federal troops from the 2nd Division entered the Midwestern city of Asaba, engaging in looting and killing civilians under the pretext of alleged sympathy for the Biafrans. In an effort to quell the violence, Asaba's leaders organized a peaceful march where townspeople pledged loyalty to Nigeria. On October 7, thousands joined the parade, singing and shouting, One Nigeria. However, Nigerian soldiers, acting on orders from Major Ibrahim Taiwo, separated men and teenage boys from their families and opened fire on them. The exact death toll, estimated to be over 700 men, remains unclear. For months, federal troops occupied Asaba, committing atrocities and causing widespread destruction. In late October 1967, Federal 2nd Division troops prepared to invade the Biafran city of Onitsha, defended by the Biafran 11th Division under Col. Conrad Nwawa. The division comprised the 11th, 12th, and 18th Battalions, responsible for different sectors. Col. Mike Ivanso led the 12th Battalion, tasked with defending areas between Ida and Nsugbe. Kolever Asam Sudo led the 18th Battalion, responsible for defending the main town of Onitsha. Leeten Col. Joseph Achuzi, known as the Hannibal of Biafra, led the 11th Battalion, defending areas between Atani and Doni. With the Niger Bridge detonated by the Biafrans, Kolum Matala Muhammad ordered an amphibious assault on Onitsha, disregarding advice to cross at Ida. On October 4, 1967, Nigerian artillery began bombarding Onitsha. Eight days later, Muhammad led a 10-boat armada carrying 5,000 soldiers across the Niger. The Biafran 18th Battalion resisted, retreating before regrouping for a counterattack. The Nigerians, instead of pursuing the retreating forces, focused on looting and burning Onitsha market, allowing the Biafrans to reorganize. 